All righty, so today we're going to talk about the history of the Israeli-Palestinian Arab conflict. In order to discuss that history, we have to go back in time, like way, way back in time. First, this particular video is sponsored by our friends over at ExpressVPN. The Jewish homeland has always been the dream in Israel. Okay, to understand how tiny this slot of land is, you kind of have to look at this map. Okay, so this tiny area right here covers Israel and actually some of some other countries. Okay, the entire map, if you were to zoom out and take a look at the Arab world, what you would see is this enormous swath of the globe. And then you would see like this tiny pinprick about half the size of New Jersey. And that constitutes modern day Israel. It's a very, very small plot of land. And if you were to look at this area, like the narrowest part of the land is currently constituted, you'd be looking at about nine miles wide right here. The Jewish history with regard to the land of Israel begins approximately 1300 BCE before the birth of Christ. Moses leaves Egypt somewhere around 1300 BCE. There are various sort of attempts to date this. A little bit later in the century, Joshua enters the land. He crosses the Jordan River, right? So the Jewish people go out here. They pass through the Red Sea. They end up wandering around in the desert. And then they enter the land of Canaan, right? Which is this whole area. By about 1000 BCE, the kingdom of David is established. Jerusalem is the capital, right? This is the first that Jerusalem matters sort of in world history. Remember, still a thousand years before Christ. By 957 BCE, the first temple of Solomon is built. It is built in Jerusalem. Now remember, this is still a good 1600 years before the rise of Islam. There's a lot of infighting among the Jews. There's a separation between the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. Those are two separate kingdoms. And you end up with ancient maps that look sort of like this. Right. This ancient map is the kingdom of Israel, which was 10 of the tribes. And then you have the kingdom of Judah, which is the one that was governed by the Davidic line. The first exile that happens to the Jews happens in 722 BCE when the Assyrians rush in from the north. You can see the Assyrian Empire at the top of this map. They rush in from the north. Then there's another exile that takes place in 586 BCE. This is the Babylonian exile. So from way the hell out here on this map, the Babylonians come in. They conquer the land and they destroy the first temple. In 515 BCE, there's this great return from Babylonia, and the second temple is built. In 63 BCE, the Romans take over. So Pompey, at that point, not the emperor, but just a general, takes over the area, and Judea becomes a vassal state. And Judea remains a vassal state of the Roman Empire, basically through the end of an independent Jewish kingdom. It's called Judea at this point. It is not called Israel. 70 CE is the destruction of Jerusalem. There's a Jewish revolt against the Roman government because of bad administrative practices and because of infighting and because of a crackdown on religious practice, and Jerusalem is destroyed. And not only is Jerusalem destroyed, the Second Temple is destroyed at the time as well. 130 to 136 CE, there is a massive revolt by the Jews under a general named Shimon Bar Kokhba, Simon Bar Kokhba. The Bar Kokhba revolt was extremely damaging to the Roman Empire. They had to expend extraordinary resources in order to stop the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is why it was almost an independent kingdom for a solid four or five years there. They renamed the area Palestine as an insult to the Jews. That's why it was named Palestine. So when people say historic Palestine, understand that the existence of Palestine was meant as a name, as an insult to the Jews who were considered the historic inhabitants of the land. And it is first used in 136 CE, a solid 1200 years after the Jews first enter the land at a minimum. Now, finally, we get to the founding of Islam. So Islam finally is founded around the seventh century CE. Arabs take over this land in about 636 CE. In 1099, the Crusaders decide that they are going to take back the land. And from 1099 to 1291, the Crusaders are fighting battles with the Islamic world and establish rule inside Jerusalem and inside Israel. In 1291, the Crusaders are defeated and a Muslim group called the Mamluks take over. They rule for a couple of hundred years. In 1517, the Ottoman Empire, another Muslim empire, takes over the entire area. Now understand, since the destruction of the Kingdom of Judea, there has not been a single independent state called Palestine, set up any time in here. It has always just been a territory of an outlying empire and pretty sparsely populated, actually, because there wasn't a lot there, as it turns out. The Ottoman Empire, this entire time from 1517 to 1918, till the end of World War I, during that time, they really didn't want you settling in the land, and so they had barred Jewish land purchase. You actually could not buy land in this area if you were Jewish. Jews started to make sort of backdoor deals with local Arabs to buy their land, and so you start seeing Jews trying to escape various places from which They've been exiled for you know thousands of years back to the Holy Land. There was a constant Jewish presence here. Throughout all of these exiles, there's never no presence of Jews in, for example, Hebron or in Jerusalem or in various areas of the Holy Land. But the first major Aliyah, which is termed the Aliyah in Hebrew, that means to go up, 
right? Because there's a, a spiritual rising that takes place when you go to the Holy Land. The first Aliyah is around 1882, it's late 19th century, and it's mostly Russians attempting to escape pogroms that are happening in Russia. By 1897, the Zionist movement begins, and this is the idea that there's going to be an independent Jewish state in Israel. It is launched by Theodor Herzl. He's the founder of the World Zionist Organization. He is not a particularly religious Jew. He launches this after the Dreyfus Affair. The Dreyfus Affair was this famous affair in France in which there was a member of the French army who was Jewish. He was falsely accused of spying for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It unleashed this giant wave of anti-Semitism. He was basically condemned despite evidence because of the anti-Semitism. And Herzl decided, well, anti-Semitism is too strong a threat. The Jews need some, some homeland to call their own. In 1917, Britain declares the Balfour Declaration. This says there will be a Jewish homeland in the area of Israel. The amount of land that was promised to the Jews was actually not just what is labeled Israel here, but also Jordan, which at this time was called Transjordan, which makes some sense in the sense that the Arab states around it were going to be Egypt, it was going to be Saudi Arabia, it was going to be Syria, it was going to be Lebanon. There are a bevy of Arab states that surround this entire region. In 1920, there are Arab pogroms against Jews in Jerusalem. So when people say that there was no conflict between Arabs and Jews until the creation of the state of Israel, that's just a lie. It's not true at all. There were major Arab pogroms against Jews in Jerusalem because Jews wanted to commit the great sin of praying at the Western Wall. This, of course, was not allowed. In 1922, this is post-World War I now, the British are given a mandate over the area of Palestine. They start walking back the promises of the Balfour Declaration. The Brits separate off Transjordan, and they call it Jordan, and they say that's going to go to the Arabs. In 1929, there's another major riot, another major anti-Jewish riot in Hebron or Hebron. The British, in response to all of this violence and all of this rioting, they decide they're going to just continually attempt to appease the Arab population in British Mandate Palestine. So they begin restricting land transfers to Jews. In 1937, the Peel Commission suggests a partition plan with control by the British retained of Tel Aviv and Jaffa and Jerusalem. And there would be like a small sliver of land Israel would get, but it would be pretty divided. It would be like this little land here, maybe a little bit up here, and then most of the Negev, which is basically just an empty desert. By this point, Jews have been moving to Palestine in increasing numbers because anti-Semitism in Europe is getting worse, but also because there's this, this nascent labor and Zionist movement, and they're really making the agricultural areas flourish again. Economic growth in this region at this time is because Jews were moving in and they were bringing their resources with them, they were bringing their know-how with them, and they were working the land. And this was driving more Arab immigration to the land also because economic activity always drives population movements. In 1939, under Arab pressure, the Brits restrict Jewish immigration to 75,000 Jews per year. The Jews are saying, listen, we have like millions of people who want to move here. And the Brits say, we're not doing that, 75,000 per year, because we have to get along with the Arab population. This is just before the Holocaust, obviously. And the Arabs reject this. The Arabs are very angry about this. They continue to launch low-level attacks on the British. They continue to attack Jewish populations. World War II breaks out. The Jews, including Jews who were heavily pushing the British to establish a Jewish state and to lift restrictions on Jewish immigration into British Mandate Palestine, they side with the Brits, right? They, they form their own divisions. They're, they're trying to help the British. What they say is that we fight for Jewish immigration to Palestine as though there were no Germans, and we fight the Germans as if there were no British, right? That, that, that's the way the Jews see it in British Mandate Palestine. They're attempting to negotiate the Arab side with Hitler. Okay, during World War II, you have Hajmin al-Husseini. He is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, one of the Palestinian leaders at the time, the Arab leaders at the time. And he was literally meeting with Hitler, attempting to encourage Hitler to establish a final solution in the Holy Land should the Germans be able to conquer that area, which the Germans came pretty close. I mean, you had Rommel literally in Egypt, right? Rommel was over here. Okay, so fast forward, you're now after World War II. Still, the British Mandate is limiting the amount of Jewish immigration into British Mandate Palestine because they're attempting to keep this conflict between the Jews and the Arabs simmering at a lower level. Okay, 1947, there is a UN partition plan because now the British mandate in Palestine, they want to end it, they want to withdraw, they don't want to be there anymore. So the UN says, okay, we're going to vote on a partition plan. It retains Jerusalem as internationally governed. Okay, so it would not have been Jewish territory or Arab territory, it would have been internationally governed. It's just this fragmented, ridiculous state. Okay, the, the state for the Jews would have been like a slice here, a little bit of a slice of the coastal area here, and then the Negev Desert down here. The Jews, are like, give us whatever you got, right? Whatever, you, whatever you're gonna give us, we will take. The Arabs instead decide that they're going to launch a bunch of low-level conflicts. So there's this kind of low-level, quiet war that's going on for about a year with Arabs attacking Jewish settlements and attempting to kill Jews and Jews attempting to defend themselves. May 14th, 1948, the British mandate officially ends. Israel declares its independence, right? This is Yom Ha'atzma'ut, 
or as the Arabs like to call it, the Nakba, right? They call it a disaster that Israel was established. The leader of Israel at this time is David Ben-Gurion. Uh, Ben-Gurion is no right-winger. He's no hardcore right-winger. Ben-Gurion was a labor socialist. Ben-Gurion was very much in favor of a wide variety of negotiations. He was quite anti-religious in sort of his own persona, um, but he understood the necessity of there being a Jewish state. In their founding documents, they asked the Arabs to stay. If you read the Declaration of Independence, of the state of Israel, they explicitly say, we want to be a state for all of our citizens. Yes, we're a Jewish state, but we want Arabs to stay. We want them to become citizens. Instead, all of the surrounding Arab countries declare war. Israel is surrounded on every side by hostile states. Every single side, right? So you got Lebanon up north, you got Syria here, you got Jordan, you got Saudi Arabia, you got Egypt down here. And then there are a bunch of far-flung states that are also getting involved, right? Morocco was part of the 1948 war. You have a bunch of states that have decided they are going to invade and they are going to destroy Israel. Like they're just going to strangle it in the crib. And they're openly saying this. And not only are they openly saying this, they're telling the Arabs who are living in the Jewish areas, get out and get out of the way so our armies can come in and we can wipe the state off the map. Well, that's not how it ends up, right? The way that it ends up is that the Jews end up basically retaining pretty much everything that's on this map with the exception of the old city of Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem ends up basically split down the middle. Jerusalem is not controlled by the Jews at this point. The Temple Mount is still controlled by the Jordanians. The way that people speak about this particular period is as if there was a Palestinian state at this point. There was not. By 1964, the Arab states have decided that they need almost a propaganda effort here. So they create the Palestine Liberation Organization. The Palestine Liberation Organization is a terrorist group. It explicitly calls for the destruction of Israel. Now you will note, at this point, Israel does not control any of this or any of this. So when they say Palestine Liberation Organization, they mean this whole thing, right? That whole thing is supposed to go away because Israel doesn't even control that at that point. And they're not calling for Palestine to be liberated from Jordan or from Egypt. They're calling for the complete destruction of the state of Israel. Okay, so in 1967, the Arabs mobilized for all-out war. And this includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes Saudi, it includes Syria. This is going to be the big war where they finally get rid of this nascent Jewish state that is less than 20 years old, right? And this is just less than three decades after the Holocaust. And Israel instead launches a preemptive war. They see this coming. They destroy the entire Egyptian air force on the ground. And in six days, they proceed to take the Golan Heights, which is this area of Syria. Israel takes over the entire Sinai Desert, takes all of Judea and Samaria to the Jordan River, takes all of the Gaza Strip, takes control of the old city of Jerusalem. Right? They do all of this in six days, which is why it's considered a miracle by the state of Israel. I mean, it's an unbelievable military performance. So in six days, they take what was going to be the war for their destruction, and they proceed to expand their borders from this tiny thing to this, this, and all of this. Israel then proceeds to give up, like, all of it, right? So Israel keeps the Golan Heights because that's a military necessity. The UN calls for Israel to withdraw from occupied territories. Now, the language here matters if you care about the UN. I don't happen to care about the UN. I think it's a garbage organization. But if you do care about the UN, there's a resolution put forward by the UN Security Council. It calls for Israel to withdraw from occupied territories, not the occupied territories. Now, that makes a difference because if it said the occupied territories, presumably it would mean anything Israel won, it would have to withdraw from if you care about the UN, which you really shouldn't. But it says occupied territories, which means subject to negotiations. The 67 Arab League Summit happens. And they agree in Khartoum, Sudan, on the three no's. No peace, no recognition, no negotiations. And these are the three no's that are going to govern the Arabs all the way through. Basically until now, until the Abraham Accords, these were the three no's that mattered. And this is all the way in 1967. So whenever people talk about there needs to be a two-state solution, why couldn't they have come to an agreement? Because literally one side said there will be no peace, no recognition, and no negotiations. One side has accepted every single peace deal provided to it to this point in time. And one side has said we will not accept any peace deal and yet somehow there's a moral equivalency between the two sides. Explain that one. Okay, 73, holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. Everybody is fasting. Everybody is praying. And a surprise attack is launched on the state of Israel. The prime minister is Golda Meir. She gets caught completely by surprise. They were warned, and they didn't take it seriously. Israel suffers extraordinary casualties in the 73 Yom Kippur War. And then once again, maintains or expands its borders a little bit. 79, Camp David Accords. Finally, there's a breakthrough. Menachem Begin takes over as prime minister of Israel a very right-wing prime minister. There were two major parties in Israel at this time, Likud and Labor. This is the first Likud prime minister. And one of the things that he does is he comes to a peace accord with Anwar Sadat, who is the nationalist leader of Egypt. And in those peace accords, Israel gives up the entire Sinai desert. Israel gives up the entire thing to Egypt in return for basically a cold peace. Anwar Sadat is then assassinated. In 1982, the Jordanian monarchy is deeply afraid that the Palestine Liberation Organization is going to overthrow the monarchy. They expel the Palestinians. The Palestinians end up in Lebanon, tens of thousands of Palestinians. Palestinian terrorist groups begin firing rockets over into Israel from South Lebanon. In 1982, Menachem Begin launches a war in Lebanon. Israel ends up basically going all the way up to the capital of Beirut and nearly occupying the entire country. 
And then they end up withdrawing under international pressure in what is considered sort of a disastrous war for the state of Israel, as always. Whenever Israel withdraws from a territory, terrorist groups take over and then threaten Israel. This is the constant pattern. No matter, the, the only time this has not happened is with regard to withdrawal from the Sinai Desert. 1987, the Intifada breaks out. This is the Palestinians in the Judea and Samaria region. The reason that I use the terms Judea and Samaria is they are more historically accurate. People call it the West Bank. Why? Because Jordan occupied it, and this is the West Bank of the Jordan River. So the only reason that it's referred to as the West Bank, which is really historically anomalous, right? it's on the east side of Israel, but it's on the West Bank of the Jordan. That's a holdover from the time when the Jordanians occupied this entire area. Again, no one cares that Jordan occupied quote-unquote Palestinian land or that Egypt occupied quote-unquote Palestinian land. They only care when Jews occupy historically Jewish land. That's when things start to get really hot and bothered. Okay, so anyway, the Intifada breaks out in 1987. You get these widespread riots and violent confrontations and terrorist attacks all the way from 1987 to 1991. By this time, Yitzhak Rabin has taken over as prime minister of Israel and pushed by George H.W. Bush, the government of the state of Israel starts negotiating with the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is a really weird shift considering the Yasser Arafat is a master terrorist responsible for tons of murders on his hand. He at this point has been expelled all the way to Tunis, right? He's not even in the picture. And Israel brings him out of retirement basically and says, why don't we negotiate with you? And maybe you can make all of this stop. So in 1993, they signed the Oslo Accords. And that is where you get Bill Clinton presiding over one of the least successful international negotiations in the history of international politics. The Oslo Accords have been a complete and utter failure. That ends with Yitzhak Rabin, who is this historic general who has been prime minister of Israel a couple of times by this point, shaking hands with a mass murdering terrorist, Yasser Arafat. And this was going to initiate a new period of health, and accord, and there's going to be peace. All that the PLO had to do was acknowledge that Israel existed and had a right to exist, stop educating their children in terrorism, and cease the violence. They couldn't do any of those things, right? So none of that happened. Instead, there's an uptick in violence, pretty dramatic uptick in violence after the Oslo Accords. In 1998, Israel again attempts to make some sort of concessions to the Palestinians, this time under the first tenure of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel does not want to govern these areas. Israel is not interested in governing millions of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip or in Judea and Samaria. The last thing they want to do is have their soldiers wandering around these dangerous areas or to preside over these areas. All they want, and all Israel has ever wanted, is to separate off from these particular areas and say, listen, you guys rule yourselves. Like, just stop bothering us, please. Okay, and you will see that this is the continued pattern. 2000, Israel engages in the Camp David negotiations. Bill Clinton is still president at this point, and the prime minister of Israel is now a guy named Ehud Barak. And Ehud Barak is a real dove. Ehud Barak wants to make as many concessions as humanly possible, right? This picture here, which is just an unbelievable picture, Bill Clinton and Ehud Barak trying to push Yasser Arafat into negotiating, right? They're all joking and they're all happy and all this kind of crap. Ehud Barak offered everything. Ehud Barak offered complete control over the Temple Mount with just like a little bit of a recognition that Israel has a historic claim religiously to the Temple Mount. Arafat turned it down flat. He offered control over virtually all of Judea and Samaria. He offered control over the Gaza Strip, right? A Palestinian state, boom, done. Arafat does not even negotiate. He just launches a massive round of violence. I remember this because I was actually in Israel right about the time they launched the Intifada and there were suicide bombings on a fairly regular basis. They blew up a Sparrow's pizza shop. I was supposed to be at that corner like a couple of hours later. This was a thing that was really scary. It was really violent. Remember, he launched that not after Israel did something aggressive, he launched that after Israel offered him everything he could possibly want if he weren't a damned liar who just wanted Israel wiped off the map. This, again, is the great lie, is that there is desire for a two-state solution from the Palestinian side. So far, there has been no evidence whatsoever that this is the case. Okay, 2004, Arafat dies, and Mahmoud Abbas takes over. Mahmoud Abbas is himself a terror supporter. He wrote his entire doctoral dissertation on Holocaust denial and why it's correct. Israel... In 2005, under the auspices of Ariel Sharon, who's one of the great hawks in Israeli history, right? he was the general in the 1973 war who ended up pushing all the way down close to Cairo. He was called the bulldozer. He's this famous general. He unilaterally withdraws from the Gaza Strip. There are a bunch of Jewish areas right in the northern tip of the Gaza Strip. Jewish soldiers went in and removed Jewish settlements in the Gaza Strip. These are places people have lived for decades. They removed them and they just turned them over to the Palestinians. Hamas, a terrorist group, immediately rushed in and burned everything. They burned the greenhouses, they burned all the Jewish houses, they knocked down all the good infrastructure, and then they just took over the place. This is when you start to see uh, an, a difference emerging among the Palestinians in terms of governance. You've got Judea and Samaria, the West Bank here, you've got the Gaza Strip here. In 2005, Abbas wins the Palestinian elections, but only because Hamas and Islamic Jihad boycott the elections. Okay, in 2006, after Israel withdraws from Gaza, remember, Israel's not in control of anything here now. Hamas wins an election. So the first move is not, oh, look, Israel wants to make concessions and make peace with us. The first move is, why don't we elect a terrorist group to actually represent us? 
Okay, in 2008, Israel's response to this is, what if we just offer you everything? So Ehud Olmert becomes prime minister of Israel, and he proceeds to offer everything to Abbas. He gives him basically the same offer, but better than the offer that Barak gave in 2000. He offers everything. He offers Judea and Samaria. He, he says, we're going to keep some of the big Israeli settlements that exist here, but we're going to give you land swaps. You can keep the Gaza Strip, everything. Abbas does not even bother to issue a counter offer. He just walks away from the table and launches violence. Gaza war begins 2008. Missiles flying in from Gaza. This is the first Gaza war. Israel has to go in in Operation Castle Ed and shut that down. 2014, this breaks out again. Another giant rocket attack from Hamas in Gaza. Israel has to go back in in 2014 and shut it down. And that brings us to today, 2021, another Gaza war in which Hamas has decided to launch rockets at the state of Israel. The real reason for that has nothing to do with land disputes in Jerusalem. The real reason has to do with the fact that Mahmoud Abbas was about to hold an election in April. He canceled it because he knew he was going to lose to Hamas. As always, the best way to garner support when it appears that you're about to go down is to start blaming the Jews and start trying to kill them. You can start an arms race between yourself and Hamas on how many Jews they can kill. So that brings us to where we are right now in 2021. A few decades ago, private citizens used to be largely that. Private, well, what changed? The internet. Think about everything you've browsed or searched for or watched or tweeted. Now imagine all of that data being crawled through and collected and aggregated by third parties into a permanent public record. Your record. Having your private life exposed for others to see, it was something that celebrities used to have to worry about, but nobody else. But now, when everybody is online, every single person is basically a public figure. To keep my data private, when I go online, I use ExpressVPN. With ExpressVPN, my connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server. My IP address is masked. Every time I turn on ExpressVPN, I'm given a random IP address and is shared by other ExpressVPN customers, which makes it more difficult for third parties to identify me and harvest my data. The best part, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. Whether you're on your phone, your laptop, your smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button to get protected. So for example, let's just say I wanted to turn on ExpressVPN right now. I would open up the app, I would get this, doink, and now it is connected. Behold the power of ExpressVPN. So if you, like me, believe that your data is your business, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN on the market. Visit expressvpn.com today. So Hamas is an actual terrorist group. Fatah, which is the military wing of the Palestinian Authority, is a terrorist group as well, and Islamic Jihad. So you have three terrorist groups running this area right here. And again, Israel has no interest in running those areas. It's the last thing that Israel really wants. It's the reason why Israel has not gone and reinvaded these areas or thrown Hamas out. They don't want their soldiers in these particular areas. What Israel has done, because they don't wish to be involved in these full-scale wars, is they've developed the Iron Dome system. So the Iron Dome system is really an incredible piece of technology. Okay, so Hamas has been firing rockets at the center of Israel. Israel is a very, very tiny state. If you were to fire a rocket from the Gaza Strip to Jerusalem, you have about 90 seconds warning before the rocket hits. Tel Aviv, which is up here, if you hit Tel Aviv, that's again a 90 second warning. If you're in Ashdod or Ashkelon, which are down here, you're getting like 15, 30 seconds warning before the rockets hit. So Israel develops this incredible technology called Iron Dome. This is what an Iron Dome battery looks like. You can see that they load up the battery with a bunch of essentially anti-missile missiles. That's, that's what they are. There is an enemy rocket that is fired. Israel has these very precise radar systems that track the rocket launches. Then there's a control system that estimates the impact point where it's going to hit. And then they fire a launcher to intercept the missile. And it doesn't bother defending against rockets. They're going to land in the middle of nowhere. They have these batteries that are set up in all of Israel's major cities. Iron Dome is basically a technological miracle. They're hitting a bullet with a bullet. And they're doing so with no time to basically figure out how to do it. It's right now succeeding at about 90% rate, which means by the way, that Israel gets to be nicer to Hamas than it otherwise would be. Because if all these rockets were actually hitting all the populated areas of Israel, Israel would just eviscerate Hamas. Like any other state, it would have no choice but to go in on the ground and just finish the job. Which is why if Hezbollah in the north, right, on the, the northern Lebanese border, decides that it wants to launch a war against Israel, they have way more ordinance than Hamas does. And so Israel would be forced to go in full scale and just do what it would have to do. Right? Israel is being incredibly pinpointed about the way that it deals with this conflict. It's dropping knock bombs on top of buildings. They're bombs that basically shake the building and say, get out. And then they bomb the building after everybody gets out. They're calling building managers and telling them to leave. We have tape of them telling building managers, clear the building. And the building manager is being like, well, we don't want to. And the Israeli is saying, well, yeah, but there are kids inside. And the building manager being like, okay, well, if you kill kids, then it's a good propaganda win for us. It's unbelievable. And yet somehow the world sees some sort of moral equivalence there. Now, there are some international political implications that have changed in the recent past with regard to Israel. I've dealt with just specifically here the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but one of the things that has happened that is really quite massive is that if you go back here, Israel currently has a cold peace with Egypt. Israel has kind of a cold peace with Jordan. And because 
the Obama administration really has strengthened Iran. The three no's of Khartoum, which you will remember were no peace, no recognition, no negotiation, they've completely disappeared for a wide variety of Arab states which have decided, guess what, the Jews aren't our enemy, Iran is our enemy. And so this is how you ended up with the Abraham Accords, where the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco, all of which have been supportive of these various wars of extinction against the Jewish state, have now decided that they're going to form a quite warm peace with Israel and recognize Israel's existence. That fundamentally changed the math on the ground. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is trying to walk that back by attempting to provide support to the radicalized Palestinian government of Fatah or of the Hamas or of, uh, or of Islamic Jihad. Alrighty, so let's talk about what exactly happened in the last couple of months that resulted in this round of, of new violence. Why don't we begin with the Abraham Accords? The Abraham Accords were this monumental shift in how people thought about the Middle East. So for decades, the conventional wisdom is there will not be peace between Israel and all these surrounding Arab states. It's the reason they call it the Israeli-Arab conflict as opposed to Israel versus the Palestinians because it was supposed to implicate all of these various countries because of the three no's of Khartoum. Right? The idea was that until Israel made some sort of deal with the Palestinians, there would never be peace in the region ever. No one could ever recognize the presence of Israel until Israel made concessions to the Palestinians. And so under that impression, Israel kept being like, okay, we'll make this concession and this concession and this concession. And the Palestinians kept being like, well, okay, we'll take those concessions. And also we're not going to do any of the things that you want us to do. So this was completely exploded by the Trump administration and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and mostly ironically by Barack Obama. So during the Obama administration, there was a real shift in how the United States treated Iran. So Iran has been threatening Israeli extinction since the Iranian revolution of 79. They've constantly been shouting death to the Jews, death to America, you know, destroy the Zionist entity. This has been part of their pitch for a very long time. And now they were developing nuclear weapons. And so Barack Obama had this bizarre vision of the Middle East in which the United States would be able to minimize its presence by essentially setting up Iran as a counterbalance to Saudi Arabia. They would create this real politique situation in which Iran had been newly moderated in some bizarre way, and they'd pushed off the nuclear agenda just long enough to get those moderates in power, and then they would be welcomed into the family of nations, and there would be this sort of balance of power between the Sunni and the Shia in the Middle East, and this would solve all problems. This was Barack Obama's new idea. It was a terrible idea because, as it turns out, there are no moderates in the government of Iran. It is run by the mullahs. This whole fake notion that the moderates were going to be emboldened by U.S. concessions was complete crap. So the Iranians continue in secret to foster their nuclear development. The Iranians take all the money that the United States is now allowing Iran to receive and spreading terrorism all over the region. So if we had a bigger map of the Middle East, what you would see is that down at the tip of Saudi Arabia is Yemen. And so there's a proxy war going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran in Yemen. The Houthis, which are an Iranian-backed terrorist group, are fighting Saudi-backed groups in Yemen, and it's led to tremendous death. The United States had basically, under Barack Obama, moved away from alliances with both Israel and with Saudi Arabia and had moved toward this sort of bizarre warmth with Iran, which is a state that wishes fully to destroy both Saudi Arabia and Israel. Well, this forced Saudi Arabia into saying, wait a second, our enemies here are not the Jews. The Jews don't care about us, right? The Jews are not bothering us. The Jews don't want anything from us. The Jews just want to live there. And here we have this Iranian state that's actually trying to blow up like our oil resources and destroy our country. And what would be awesome is if we could form some sort of kind of covert alliance. And so all of the Saudi sort of proxy states, including the UAE and Bahrain and all the other Sunni states in the region, decided, wait a second, our enemy is not the Jews. Our enemy is the Iranians. And so they started fostering relations in, in kind of covert ways with the Israelis, to the point where even during the Obama administration, there was talk about how Israel might use Saudi Arabian airspace in order to strike at Iran, which is located over here on the map. There's all this kind of new ties that are being forged. The new Egyptian regime, which is a regime that had been Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood took over after the Arab Spring that was much vaunted. It was supposed to heal the world and all of this really didn't. The Muslim Brotherhood was ousted. General al-Sisi took over in Egypt. He's been much friendlier with Israel. The Saudis have been much friendlier with Israel. Then along comes the Trump administration, and they decide they're going to turn decades of conventional wisdom about the Israeli-Palestinian issue and its centrality on their head. So the idea was, if you can force Israel into making enough concessions, and if you can just stop them from saying that they like Jerusalem and they want to keep Jerusalem, if you can just stop them from doing all this, maybe, maybe you will wheedle the entire Muslim world into accepting Israel's presence. The Trump administration comes along like, nah, this is, this is nonsense. Okay, so we can see these burgeoning ties between Israel and these Arab countries. The Palestinian issue is a completely different issue. It's completely separate. So instead, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make very clear to everybody that we actually back Israel's right to exist 
and we back Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem, and we back Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. We're going to take those off the table. The Arabs no longer have a right to expect that Israel is going to give that stuff up because we say that they don't, we're not going to push them on that. And we are going to foster ties between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. And shock of shocks, it turns out that all these Arab nations decide our enemy ain't the Jews, our enemy is the Iranians. And so we really should foster ties with these folks and create this sort of new regional security block. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, Joe Biden takes over and Joe Biden decides, come on, man. And he says, we're going to ditch all of the progress that was just made. We're going to pretend the Abraham Accords never happened. And we're going to start making overtures to Iran. Simultaneously, we are going to undo another Trump administration policy. So the Trump administration made very clear, we are not going to pretend that we are honest brokers between Israel and a bunch of terrorist groups. Instead, we are just going to make clear our support for Israel. And we're going to withdraw funding from, for example, Fatah and the Palestinian Authority and the UNRWA and Hamas. We're just going to take away the funding from these various organizations. Biden comes in, he says, I'm going to restore the status quo ante. I'm going to try and get back into the Iran deal and allow Iran to foster terrorism with U.S. taxpayer dollars and with us allowing money to flow into Iran. I'm going to restore aid to all of these Palestinian terror groups. And so the Palestinians are like, OK, I guess now's a good time to push. And the Iranians are saying, OK, now is it now's a good time for us to, to push because we have an administration in power that obviously is not pro Saudi, that is obviously not pro Israel. So if we push a little bit, We'll see kind of where exactly, how far we can push here. Factor number two is that the Palestinian Authority has not held an election since 2006. Mahmoud Abbas was last elected in 2005. He is now in the 16th year of a four-year term. So when people talk about Israel is undemocratic and apartheid, 20% of Israel is Arab. There are Arabs who sit on the Supreme Court. There's a major Arab party called Ra'am, which is part of the Israeli Knesset. It's just a lie that, that Israel is an apartheid state. The true apartheid state is the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Zero Jews live there. And... They have not held an election in any of these areas for nearly two decades. So Abbas, in an attempt to appease the Biden administration and the incoming Democratic power base in the United States and the international community, he wants to show that he's legit. We're going to hold an election, says Mahmoud Abbas, who is nearly, who's, I believe, 80 years old. It turns out nobody likes Mahmoud Abbas. So Hamas looked like it was about to take over not just the Gaza Strip, but also the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. And so like a couple of weeks before the election, Abbas is like, you know what? Bad idea. No elections. And knowing that this is going to set off a conflagration, Abbas starts pushing violence against Israel. The Fatah, who control all television in the West Bank, they start putting out videos about how it's good if you can kill a Jew. They start really ramping up a lot of the anti-Israel rhetoric. There are a bunch of incidents in which TikTok videos are taken of Palestinian youths in Jerusalem beating up Jews, and these are being celebrated. So there are a couple of pretexts that are, that are used in order to redirect from, I'm canceling the election, to it's all the Israelis' fault. So in the it's all the Israelis' fault category, there are particularly two issues that they've been pushing. One is that the Palestinians were barred from entry via the Damascus Gate, which is a gate into Jerusalem, entry to the Temple Mount. Now, there were some roadblocks placed there because Israel was afraid that people were going to congregate and riot, which they promptly did as soon as Israel removed the roadblocks. So Israel <laughs> removed the roadblocks, people congregated, they rioted, they did violence. Okay, this was used as a pretext to say that Israel was restricting access to the Temple Mount. I've been to the Temple Mount. Muslims have full and free reign over the Temple Mount. The Islamic Waqf controls the Temple Mount. They have since 1967. Israel won back all of the old city of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount. And Moshe Dayan, who was the general of the Israeli army at the time, he handed over the keys to the Temple Mount to the Islamic Waqf. And so Jews are not allowed to pray openly on the Temple Mount right now, which is insane. The Muslims complained that on the one hand, worship wasn't being allowed there. Not true. 100% not true. During the middle of this Chaos, by the way, 100,000 Muslims went up there during Ramadan, at the end of Ramadan, to pray on the Temple Mount. Doesn't sound like very good restriction of religious rights there. Okay, so a bunch of Fatah and Hamas members take over Al-Aqsa Mosque. They bring in rocks from the surrounding area. They bring in projectiles. They start throwing them at police. They put Hamas flags on the top of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's a terrorist group, a genocidal terrorist group. They start attacking the Israeli police. When the Israeli police go and shut it down, then they say, oh, Israel is being aggressive in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that's why we need to start firing missiles. Okay, that is reason number one. It's a pretext and it's a lie. Reason number two is this long-standing legal dispute over an area of Jerusalem known as Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah is sort of an outskirt of Jerusalem. It's a little suburb. It's known by Jews as Shimon HaTzadik. It's known by Arabs as Sheikh Jarrah. Okay, so in the 1870s, there were a bunch of Jews who arrived in this area of Jerusalem, and they bought up a bunch of plots of land in Shimon HaTzadik. Shimon HaTzadik, he's a Talmudic era sage, and so his grave is supposed to be there. So Jews bought a lot of the territory that are right around. They have all the legal land bills and all of that. Heavy Jewish population in Sheikh Jarrah, up until the 1948 war. The 1948 war happens, and as mentioned, Jordan takes over this entire arena, including the old city of Jerusalem. 
And they proceed to put barbed wire there and Jews aren't allowed in, no freedom of worship, the whole deal. During that time, the Jordanian government hands over to some people in Sheikh Jarrah legal title to those homes. So they say, we took this over. Here's a title. You own the home now. Some people, they didn't give legal title. For whatever reason, it got caught up in the bureaucracy or these people they didn't particularly like. For whatever reason, they don't have the legal title to those homes. Israel in the 67 war wins back Sheikh Jarrah, Shimon HaTzadik, and all the people who had the legal title, they're like, okay, well, I guess you live there now. All the people who didn't have legal title, the people who were the previous landowners came with the legal title and they said, okay, this is our land. We want our house back. And the Israeli courts came up with a solution. And their solution was, you can continue to live in the house, but you have to pay rent to the people who own the legal title, which frankly is not a bad solution. For 50 years, the Palestinians were living there, don't pay rent for 50 years. So the heirs and assigns of these particular land titles decide, you know what? We actually would like to knock down these four houses and we want to build an apartment complex there. This is what this whole thing is about, supposedly, which it isn't. It's just a normal real estate dispute over eviction and terms of rent and all of this. And Israeli court finds, okay, well, they haven't paid rent, so they're going to be evicted. This is held up, right? The Israeli government says we're not going to implement this right now. We want this to go all the way to the Supreme Court. It'll be adjudicated there. This is used as a pretext by the Palestinians to riot. It is used as a pretext by Hamas to fire rockets into the area. And the suggestion is this is Israel being aggressive and engaging in ethnic cleansing, which is weird because there are plenty of Arab families living in Sheikh Jarrah who are not being evicted because either A, they paid their rent, or B, they actually had the legal land titles to the homes in which they were living. East Jerusalem is still extremely heavily Arab. For a country that's being accused of ethnic cleansing, Israel is markedly incompetent at ethnic cleansing, considering that the population of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and Jerusalem has vastly and exponentially increased over the course of the last 50-odd years. Those are the pretexts for the conflict. The actual reason for the conflict is Abbas canceled the elections, he ramped up the violence, and Hamas, in competition, said, okay, well, Fatah's going to ramp up the violence. We can't be left out, man. A party's a party. And so they start firing rockets into Israel at civilian centers. Now, Hamas does, because they're a terrorist group, as they put all of their rockets in civilian areas to try and stop Israel from attacking them because they know that Israel actually cares about civilians, whereas they do not. A lot of the foreign aid that was being granted and given to Hamas was not being used for actual aid. It was not being used for electricity or water. Israel's been providing electricity and water to the Gaza Strip for free for years. Hamas didn't use any of this money to actually build up infrastructure or help people. They used it to build these giant terror tunnels and stock up on rockets. These rockets, by the way, being provided by the same Iranian government that the American government is currently attempting to negotiate with under Joe Biden, which makes no sense at all. It's also the reason why, by the way, why 200 Democrats just voted last week that they would not place sanctions on any company that was doing business with Hamas or donating money to Hamas. There's a bill in 2019, identical bill, said cut off funding to any company that does business with Hamas. It passed unanimously in the House. Now that Joe Biden is president and trying to negotiate with Iran, 200 Democrats voted it down and never saw the light of day in the House of Representatives. That is where things currently stand. Israel is attempting to do what it can to wipe out Hamas's capacity to, to fire rockets indiscriminately at its civilian population without having to actually do a ground invasion of, of the Gaza Strip because, frankly, there are no good solutions there. If Israel goes in and wipes out Hamas, then maybe Islamic Jihad takes over, maybe Fatah takes over, maybe the next level of Hamas takes over. The only thing that has actually guaranteed peace in the region at all for any prolonged period of time was, in fact, Israeli troops on the ground staffing these areas, but Israel doesn't want to be there. And so the two alternatives historically have been Israel has to subject itself every few years to a barrage of rocket attacks, go in, knock out some infrastructure. You get a couple of years of peace. Same thing happens in a couple of years. Or you have to have a long-term, quote-unquote, occupation in which Israel basically attempts to pacify by keeping a certain baseline level of troops in a particular area. So as you see, it took a very long time just for me to go through the basic history of this conflict. And that's the very basic history of this conflict. There's a lot more there. There are a lot of resources out there. But suffice it to say, the media members, who try to boil this down to just a border dispute or try to suggest that this is just a matter of Benjamin Netanyahu. It's coming from ignorance and it's coming from stupidity. Do your reading before you bother to comment on the situation. One of the things that you will have noted in the news is that every time there's a, an uptick in, in the violence in this particular region that involves Israel, there's widespread anti-Semitic attacks that happen all over the world. You're seeing it happen right now every place from L.A. to New York to Europe. And there's this argument that's constantly made by people, particularly on the left. Well, if Israel didn't exist, wouldn't there be less anti-Semitism? Well, first of all, as we've talked about, you'd have to ignore every bit of history from 136 CE all the way to 1948 to get to that point. There's something quite ironic about somebody beating a Jew in the street over Israel saying, if Israel didn't exist, I would stop beating this Jew. The reality is that not every criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, of course, just like not every criticism of the United States is anti-American. But every anti-Semite is anti-Israel. Every single one. And there's a heavy crossover between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism for sure.